All right. Um, well, good afternoon. My name is Florian, um, and I'm going to do a quick rundown of cool stuff that you can do with DRBD. Um, eucalyptus, incidentally, being one of them. Not one that I'm going to be specifically talking about, but it's something that you can actually do with it. Um, so what I'm going to uh, give you in the next about 30 minutes is, for those of you who are not familiar or who haven't heard about DRBD before, I'm going to give you a very quick rundown of what it actually does and how it works. And then I'm going to dive into um, some example applications or example use cases uh, for DRBD, giving you three there in uh, total. So what's this DRBD thing, um, really? Um, DRBD is a high availability uh, storage replication solution. And in high availability, there's two ways where we can actually get to our data. This is sort of the very conventional approach. This is what we call the shared everything approach, where you have a single data silo, um, and then you have multiple server nodes accessing that silo in a shared fashion, which has a number of drawbacks. Uh, number one, you have to um, counteract the issue of what we call split brain. You have to work with something that uh, is commonly referred to as node fencing, uh, where you make sure that these nodes don't um, access this type of storage in an uncoordinated fashion, because that, in essence, would mean that you'd have to bust out your backups. But there is a technical solution for that. Like I said, it's called node fencing. The other thing, the other drawback that we have is that while in this thing we have nice redundancy at the server level, we have no redundancy whatsoever at the data level. And once our data becomes inaccessible for whatever reason at all, it need not necessarily be permanent. But as, as soon as the data becomes uh, inaccessible in any way, all of our nice server redundancy is, in essence comes to naught and we don't have any data to serve. So to counteract that, we have a different approach, and that's what we call the shared nothing approach. And in shared nothing, we have, rather than having one single data silo, we actually have multiple silos, one dedicated to each and every node. And we make sure through uh, replication at the block level that these storage devices are actually in sync at any given time. So any of these nodes sees a view of this data that is fundamentally identical to having just a single shared storage data silo. And DRBD is a technology that enables exactly that. Um, DRBD officially stands for nothing. Uh, but what it might be interpreted as is distributed replicated block device. And what it is, is I usually explain this sort of from, from bottom to top. First and foremost and fundamentally, it is a block device. It's something that lives in the kernel. We've been upstream since 2.6.33. We've been a number of distributions as an out of three model prior to that. So um, it's basically been around for a very, very long time. It is fundamentally a block device. It lives at the block layer of the kernel. And as such, all it understands are blocks. All it can work with are blocks. It doesn't know what replication means for a file system. It actually doesn't care or know what a file system is. It also doesn't care about any of its other workloads. If it's something that uses a block device, then you can run it on DRBD. It's that simple. DRBD is replicated, which means that all of the I.O. that goes to the device is synchronously replicated to a second node. And I'm going to get to what that means in detail in just a second. And it is distributed in the sense that a DRBD device always spans two cluster nodes. We can, of course, work in a standalone mode where one of the nodes is gone for a time specifically. I mean, that's the typical use case for, well, one node fails. So we have to work in a standalone mode as well. But fundamentally, the, the, the device as such is always distributed across exactly two cluster nodes. So how does this work? Go ahead. Um, one single device is always two. We can use what we call device stacking, where we layer one DRBD device atop another, where uh, we can get up to, say, for example, a four node redundancy. And if we want to, we can actually have part synchronous, part asynchronous redundancy. So a relatively typical use case for device stacking is you have two nodes in one cluster, and you have two nodes in a completely different cluster, which might be in a separate fire area or a separate building or in a different city. And you always replicate locally, synchronously, within the data center. And then you replicate asynchronously off-site. That's another option. But for a single DBD device, it's always two nodes as of DBD8. So the way this works is, Every uh, DRBD resource, as we call it, has a role. And that role can either be primary or secondary. When a DRBD resource, and this is 
per node, obviously. And we can, of course, have as many DOBD resources as we want on, an, on a node, and we can have as many in the primary and as many in the secondary role that we want on any node at any given time. When a node is in the primary role, uh, or a resource is in the primary uh, role on a given node, then we can literally do anything that we want with the device. We can read from it, we can write to it, and every time we write to it, um, what happens is we replicate that write over to the secondary node. It doesn't work quite as simply as it's depicted here on the slide, but it's a good enough approximation to illustrate what's going on. What we do is we recall or we write this block locally at the same time we recall, okay, this block is out of sync for the time being. We replicate this over to the peer node. We then write it there. And only when that is confirmed, and this is what we refer to as synchronous replication, only when it's confirmed do we send an acknowledgement back. By the way, this is a DOBD in protocol acknowledgement. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the TCP Act, which is completely separate from it. Um, and once that is done, we acknowledge to the application, yes, that block has been written. So we can guarantee that when we're in this connected mode, whatever gets written actually gets written twice, and once locally and once remotely. That happens pretty much all the time, and of course we can have any number of uh, parallel write I.O. going on at any given time just as well. Yes? But you're replicating blocks, not changes. Yes. Well, the way it works, yeah, so the way it works, what we, what we get is uh, from upper layers is just the bio, right? And um, what we do is we hand these bios down in the local I.O. stack, and we hand it off to uh, and we encapsulate it and hand it off on the, on the network layer as well. And then we uh, get that packet over on the receiving node, we unpack it, we get its payload, and then we send out another bio. It's just like one single bit changed in the whole block. You transfer the whole block. Well, that's not the way block I.O. works, really. I mean, the way, the way that you write to a block device is always in sectors. And if you write a single, if you have to write a single byte to um, to, to a block device, what actually happens is we read one sector, then we splice it that one byte, and splice in that one byte, and then we seek again, and then we have to rewrite it. I agree that, that this is nature of writes. Yeah. This is not the nature of network. For example, if this is a synchronization between two data centers and the yes. slow, yeah. and basically increase the speed much, like uh, 10 times, in fact, 10, 100 times, if you transfer one of the changes. On yes. The that is something. Right, yes. That would be something that you would have to implement at the file system level. The way that DOBD operates as a block device is the only thing that we can deal with is blocks. And when we get a modification like that, then basically we're shipping a whole sector. That's how it works. Um, a key sort of a performance advantage here for DOBD as opposed to conventional SAN or NAS based type uh, clustering or high availability is we can always read locally, which is kind of nice because in a SAN or NAS based setup, every time we read, and that is a read that actually that doesn't go to the, that we don't read from the, from the page cache, but that actually hits the disk, we have to go through some sort of network layer. And that network layer can be very, very um, slim and lightweight, like fiber channel, or it can be relatively fat, like, for example, accessing a Samba store over SIFS. Um, and in DOBD, we have none of that. We can always read locally from a local disk over a local bus, which tends to be um, a lot faster than going through any sort of network stack in terms of latency. And it also provides better throughput on reads, which is kind of nice. Um, when as I mentioned previously, when we run into the situation where we lose one of our nodes, and this can be through to actual hardware failure, it can be just simple a maintenance task, just we shut down the server, then obviously it wouldn't make sense to carry on with this synchronous replication permanently waiting for the other node to be checking back in, because it meant, it, what we would be doing is just freeze I.O. to the surviving node, which is, well, it's a poor idea of high availability, if you ask me. Um, and what we do then is we automatically switch to what we call disconnected mode. And this disconnected mode, we, of course, still accept writes. And um, we just simply continue to record which of these blocks are out of sync. And of course, we can continue to read locally as well. And then when the secondary node comes back in, we run a resynchronization process, which means that the blocks which were previously out of sync are now 
shipped over to the peer and then cleared out of the bitmap and um, eventually the device returns to being in full sync again. So um, very, very simple and, and straightforward actually. We have these two processes here that sort of run in parallel at this point. We have the foreground process of block by block or bio by bio shipping, which is what we call replication. And then we also have this process of the devices coming back in sync again, which is what we call synchronization. So these are really two distinct things. They happen in parallel at this time. And of course, DOBD is also smart enough to do things like, oh, this block is out of sync. I need to ship it. OK, I'll do that later. Oh, and now we've got another write coming in on the same block. Well, I'll just replicate that over now and just clear the bit in the bitmap. And I don't have to sync afterward, because otherwise I would be shipping the same block twice. Now, of course, we build high availability clusters not in order to be protected against losing our backup node. I mean, that's kind of nice if we, we, if we can recover from that. But obviously, what we really build them for is um, losing or, or suffering a problem on our active node, right? So here's how this works. And that is, we would have a DOBD resource that is happily uh, humming along it's replicating, uh, we're writing to it, we're reading from it, everything is going quite normally, and then um, all of a sudden our primary node goes away. Excuse the artifact here. But um, what this is meant to illustrate is basically we just lose the primary node, and now what has to happen, I wonder why these are still left over here. I didn't have that when I rehearsed it. Anyway. Um, <laughs> hmm? Oh, yeah, indeed. <laughs> Obviously, you know. <laughs> I mean, it has 15,000 lines of German comments in it. I mean, um, anyway, uh, so what is, what's, what's, what's then kicking in is any sort of high availability cluster manager. So the canonical um, implementation of this is the pacemaker cluster manager, but DOBD integrates just as well with Red Hat cluster and with a number of other clustering solutions. So DOBD is completely cluster manager agnostic that way. Um, but it's the cluster manager's job to now do what we call promotion, promote the previously secondary node to the primary role. So we can now use the device on the node that now simply takes over the application, the new primary node that um, continues to run our service. So um, DOBD does none of these of this of this primary secondary transition by itself. It also it always comes from the outside, either manually, very rarely seen in production. But typically, the canonical use case is we have a cluster manager, and that is the um, the the machinery that just affects this uh, transition. So what can we do with this now? Like I said, this is a block device. So we can use it for literally anything that writes data to block storage. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I just want to say before you go on. Yeah, no problem. Um, so when the, when the secondary becomes the primary, yeah. is it now queuing up changes in case the previous primary comes back? Yes, of course. Of course. And basically what you have then is you just have a rule reversal. And now this is a primary with its secondary gone offline. And then again, it just tracks the changes um, in its in its quick sync bitmap, just like I previously explained. So, bring, bring the other one back up as yes, primary. exactly, exactly. And when the when the when the when the previous primary comes back up, we just do another um, resync. Um, believe it or not, there's actually plenty of proprietary storage um, replication solutions that, to this day, cannot do this. That actually do a bitmap resync when the primary crashes, and oftentimes they have to do like a full sync which is really, really fun if you have a multi-terabyte device. Um, but um, DOBD handles that very, very nicely. Go ahead. So how do you decide that something's actually failed? Because like, one of the folks on the counter is have a, like, a hardware brain device. Yeah. One of the disks starts responding really slowly. Yeah. So it's like completing eventually. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a very good question because um, that's one of the more challenging issues. Um, what you're referring to is something that is that we typically call an I/O tar pit, where you have a device that is not throwing I/O errors and is just getting really, really, really slow, uh, which is sort of a pain in the neck um, because there's not really something that you can do to handle this. Um, so what DOBD does very well is we can do. Um, 
we call this a, to detach a backing device. When a dev and this is essentially uh, something very similar to what MD does. If you're familiar with, with MD uh, software aid, uh, where in the case of an I.O. error, you can just fail the device. DBD can do the same thing. We just, we just have a different um, term for it. We call it detach, where if a device actually produces an I.O. error, we can kick it and, uh, or literally kick it out of the DBD resource. And uh, we can then, it, this doesn't actually mean, by the way, that we have to shift over the application. We can just, we can just have the application continue to read, and read from and write to the same block device. It's just, Shipping everything over the network, DBD can do that transparently. Um, so that's kind of neat. But the other thing is when we don't get an I/O error, and um, the thing just gets miserably slow. Um, and there, it's basically up to guesstimating. So DBD does have a feature where we can uh, where we can watch the time that it takes for IOs to complete, and we can, it's, it's sort of like a knockout count in boxing. Um, and so when the count hits a certain configured value, we can say, okay, this secondary is no longer, you know, good enough and we're just going to kick it. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's sort of tricky. It doesn't catch all of these, um, of these issues. You may have a, a SCSI controller, for example, that is doing its damnedest to sort of mask that problem from you, and it just gets miserably slow. That's, admittedly, that's sort of a, a, a tricky issue to solve. So DBD does tend to bend over backward to catch even that, but there's no guarantees there. Um, but obviously, you know, there's, in, in, in HA setups, there's other ways to catch that, like hardware watchdogs and that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, so, what can we actually do with this? Like I said, it's a block device. We can use it for anything that runs on a block device. So, for example, we could run. This is just an overview of the stack. Um, I'll just skip through that. We can run it, for example, for a database. I'm. I've just, I'm just using the slides that I have here for Oracle just to illustrate that we're not necessarily limited to um, open source software here um, in terms of what we, can, what we can serve as storage. Obviously, this works just as well with MySQL, works well with Postgres, works well with Drizzle. Um, Oracle is just an example. So here, what we, what, we, what we would typically have is we have a DBD replicated uh, block device, which acts as the storage for our Oracle table spaces, redo logs, archive logs, you name it. Uh, we have all of that managed with the Pacemaker cluster manager, and uh, we have Pacemaker also managing the Oracle database itself, and something that the clients use to connect to the Oracle database, namely the TNS listener. What's kind of nice about this is that we can have all of the application servers, all the clients of that Oracle database, point to just one virtual IP address that the TNS services listen on. And if one node, uh, if we want to migrate the service, very, very simple. That's just, uh, it's basically one command that we issue just to the cluster manager. And it will happily move all of these resources over. Now, DOB makes sure that Oracle sees exactly the same data on the destination node, like it saw on the source node. Um, we also make sure with Pacemaker, with the virtual IP addresses, that the service itself is continues to be available under the exact same IP address, so we have to do nothing to the configuration of the application servers or the database clients. For them, it's just like, well, a brief interruption of the database daemon or of the, um, or of the TNS listener daemon, and we'll just then continue, and the database will be none the wiser in terms of, hey, this is actually on a different physical node. Yes? That is correct, yes. Um, and, and you're highlighting an, an important point here, and that is DOBD is, um, I remember MC Brown did a thing for Memcache where he repeatedly kept saying, it's just the cache. I should have a lot of slides saying, it's just the block device. Because that's really what it is. It has no clue of, say, for example, file system integrity, let alone application integrity. So yes, you would have to do things like, um, flushing, or like syncing the file system, flushing caches, etc., which actually highlights a different issue, and that is, what if the node actually physically fails? 
the failover process is functionally identical to pulling the power plug and putting it back in. Um, if your application is not crash safe, DBD won't make it crash safe. If your application is crash safe, then there is no way DRBD is going to break that crash safety because the block device looks exactly like it did at the time when we, uh, when we failed over. So yes, uh, we would have to go through, for example, a journal replay on a journaling file system. We would have to go to some roll back, roll forward, commit, whatever process um, in a database. And yes, this may take time. So this is actually something that is relatively important in terms of tuning specifically database applications. Database applications you typically tune to write to disk as late and as rarely as humanly possible which is great in terms of performance. And it will also, if the database is in fact crash safe, it will also not wreck your data in case of any sort of failure. But it may hugely increase your recovery times in case of failure. So that's sort of a, a balancing act that you have to take into account here. If you want to make your database highly available, do take into account your SLAs, your minimum uptimes, and um, in, in um, by extension, uh, your maximum failover times that you're, uh, that you're prepared to allow. So very good point there. So um, that much for databases. What we can also do with DRBD and with the pacemaker cluster stack is manage virtualization. And um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because uh, Tim and I have a talk about this um, tomorrow in the main conference, um, tomorrow afternoon. But um, the way that, it, that this can work in a, on, a, on a small scale, and, we're, and tomorrow we're going to talk about something where we can do this on a larger scale as well. Um, you just have a DOBD and storage replication, and you then slap virtual machine images on top of this. And there's a multitude of ways of doing this. You can, for example, use the raw DOBD block devices and just use those as virtual block devices for your virtual machines. You can have DOBD and then just a regular file system such as XFS, for example, um, and throw your VM, uh, your, your QCOW images in there. Um, you could also have something like, uh, you could use DOBD in dual primary mode and run a cluster file system on top of it, like OCFS2 or GFS, and then have your virtual machines in there, which is kind of cool because you can now migrate full virtual machines. And this is something, and, and, and very, very simply, and like in, on the smallest scale, that doesn't, this doesn't require any sort of SAN whatsoever. We can have like a two node cluster just running DRBD between those, those nodes and we can use that to make virtual machines highly available and migrate them very, very simply and easily uh, between these machines. And um, we can do all sorts of cool stuff there um, with like completely, do, of course, doing things like live migration where you have no uh, service interruption at all as you migrate, et cetera. I had that slide in here twice. Sorry about that. And then if uh, one of the node fails, obviously, we can also do the same thing here as we do with the database recovery, and that is to simply bring up those virtual machines on a different host and have very, very short and, and quick recovery times uh, that way. And um, yeah, what's nice about this is, is this is also, obviously, I mean, this has nothing to do with DOBD, but the stack as such is pretty much hypervisor agnostic because the stack as such simply plugs into libvirt and therefore supports anything that libvirt supports. So what, we, what, we're, what we've described here is, is it applies to Zen just as it does to KVM. Um, if you're using OpenVZ or Linux containers, it's the same thing. So it doesn't actually, it's not even limited to virtualization as such. You can also use container-based solutions in, in, the same, in the same vein, so to speak. And finally, um, a, a third example application that I wanted to show, and this is also something that we're going to explore in more detail in our talk tomorrow, is um, you can literally use DOBD to like, replace your SAN altogether by just slapping iSCSI storage 
on top of DRBD. And all of that is completely manageable by the pacemaker cluster stack. So from bottom to top, you have the storage replication, you have a redundant uh, cluster messaging infrastructure, you have the cluster manager itself, which is pacemaker, and then you have simply something that interfaces with an iSCSI target daemon. And there again, we're supporting, we support three at this point. So um, the same cluster stack and indeed the same configuration can be used no matter whether your preferred iSCSI target is IET or TGT or LIO. All of that is fine. We support all of that. And um, then you can build stuff like this where you have like a complete iSCSI SAN in an active active capacity where you have two nodes. Uh, one node is running half of your iSCSI targets and the other node is running the other half of your iSCSI targets, both of which are synchronously replicated sort of in a crisscross fashion between those nodes. And then you have your, your iSCSI initiators, um, which can be anything. Again, here we're not limited to Linux. It can be a Windows or Solaris or whatever um, iSCSI initiator and just use your iSCSI targets and the logical units on those targets, and you have a drop-in replacement for your SAN at a fraction of the cost, obviously. Yes? Can you export uh, one LUN to two targets at the same time? Can I export one LUN to two targets at the same time? Are you, are you talking about the... Uh, so I can have iSCSI LUN. Yes. Um, I'm not aware of... Um, of, of that feature in IET or TGT, I don't think I can do that because they both issue, when, when I export a block device on as one LUN, then that LUN is directly associated with a target and the ISCSI targets issue BD claim on that block device, so they basically own it. So for those two, I'm fairly certain that it's not possible. LIO, I'm not sure. You don't have any connection between two ISCSI targets. Yes, so? Yeah? So, both iSCSI targets can claim, hey, I have this block device, I will export it. Um, you mean from, from both nodes? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so there's, um, if, if you want to do that, then that would require that you run uh, DRBD in a dual primary mode, because otherwise you simply don't have access to the same block device from both nodes. But there's, there's right? an interesting thing which iSCSI adds. Ask as it has this thing called reservation, where you can yes. put a reservation on the lab. Yes. So now you have to communicate the reservation between two ask as targets. Somehow. Yep. Yes. Well, no, not necessarily between two ice as targets. The way that people, so the PR thing is, um, a whole different ball game in itself. Basically, there's all sorts of. Uh, all sorts of nice little uh, side issues with that. But basically, the thing is, if the iSCSI implementation actually stores its persistent reservation information on the block device in some shape or form, then we're fine because we're replicating all of that along. Mm -hmm. If it's not, then we have to replicate the PR information separately, but manage it in the same cluster stack and also manage it by pacemaker. Yes. One, two. Yes, we can replicate asynchronously. Um, so, DBD has three different replication modes uh, or protocols, as we call them. Um, the one that's most frequently used is Protocol C, which is the fully synchronous replication that I previously explained. What we also have is an asynchronous replication, Protocol A. The way it works is um, normally we write locally. We um, we put a packet on the wire, and when, it's, when it comes back as acknowledged, then we clear it from the transfer log. What we do in protocol A is we clear a packet from the transfer log as soon as we've handed it down on the local I.O. stack, and we've stuck it on the wire. Now, the thing that I, we stick it on the wire in this case means put it in the TCP send buffer, and that buffer drains when packets are being acknowledged by the peer. So therefore, um, DRBD in this configuration is as asynchronous as your TCP network send buffer is large. And unfortunately, the, um, the, the, the TCP send buffer doesn't scale indefinitely. So you can toss it up to something like 8 meg or 16 meg or something like that. 
but then you hit certain limits, and that's basically the limitation of our asynchronicity. But we have, uh, there's, a, there's a user space add-on product called DRBD proxy that basically takes care of that, which just buffers everything in memory. Do you have another question? Um, have you ever played around with using RDMA as the protocol for talking to the other peer? Um, sort of. Um, so uh, for the replication uh, itself, uh, DOBD uses in kernel, in essence, BSD sockets. So DOBD can use uh, pretty much anything for which a BSD-like socket implementation exists. Um, and one of the things that do exist that are RDMA, RDMA capable um, is SDP over InfiniBand and an, 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 an implementation of SDP, which is a, so a socket stack direct protocol, um, exists in OFED, which is sort of the InfiniBand stack that ships with, with most distros. Um, so if you have a reasonably uh, recent OFED, which means 1.5 plus, then you can replicate DRBD over SDP and use all of the capabilities that are available there. Well, the way you do it in user space is typically, you know, you have an LD preload or something that doesn't work in the kernel. Uh, so what you have to do is you just add a keyword in a DRBD conf and then, then selects, you know, PFSDP and AFSDP from that. The addressing itself is identical to IPv4. So what you have to do is you have to configure the InfiniBand stack. So these are actual valid SDP addresses. And then you tell DRBD, okay, you can actually... Um, you can actually replicate over SDP. There's another thing that I had, um, which is SCSI RDMA. Yeah. For writing to the actual disk. Right. Yeah. But nah. I guess you don't really need it with this. Right. Exactly. Yes? Well, just as we covered before. Uh, no problem. How do you deal with the dual failures, i.e., Failure during recovery. Okay, are you talking about dual power failure or no? What? The 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 primary failed. Yes. The secondary failed over. Yes. Secondary is now primary. Yes. The primary comes up. The old primary yes. comes up. Starts recovering. Yeah. And then the new primary fails. Yes. What happens in this situation? Okay, so you're talking about a failure while we are synchronizing. Yes. Okay, good question, because um, at the time when we're doing this bitmap-based resynchronization, um, we have what we, on the, on, on the synchronization target, we have what we call an inconsistent device, because part of it is up to date, part of it is in the process of being synchronized, and for an application it's impossible to tell which is which. So, um, bluntly speaking, if you're running into a failure while you're synchronizing, and you can't recover your current primary, then you're almost screwed because on the secondary you now have an inconsistent device that you can't really use. That is inherent to all sorts of bitmap-based synchronization, so there's nothing that we can do about this um, short of re-implementing the whole thing to be um, transactional and write lock based. But the typical, um, uh, the, the typical sort of workaround uh, to this, which is very well integrated into DRBD, is you run uh, DRBD on top of an LVM logical volume, and in DRBD we have certain hooks and events that fire when um, a synchronization starts and when it completes. And we have um, integration scripts with um, LVM that ship with DRBD, which do the following thing, and that is we start a synchronization, we now take a snapshot of the, off of the uh, synchronization target so we now have something to go back to in case something fails. And once the synchronization completes, we just remove that snapshot. Yes? You mentioned in your SCSI example, yep. you have the ability to run to have, to have, uh, dual Yeah. Um, and I assume that works in your SCSI because your SCSI is a block. So yeah. Yeah. On both posts all the way through, so there's no um, difference in, the, in memory caches on the right. chains to, to the actual um, blocks on the disk. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what I was referring to there is actually, it's, we, ha we have to distinguish two things here. One is active-active from the application standpoint, which is, for example, you have two clusters running, say, two database instances or two iSCSI targets, and they can either run you know, on both nodes or they can converge in one, uh, which is perfectly fine, but which doesn't require um, any special modifications to DOBD. It's just you have two separate DOBD resources that can fill over independently. So, and we call that active-active. And the other thing is where you actually have DOBD that is writable from both nodes. And um, just for clarity, we tend to use the term dual primary for that, because, just in order to distinguish. And that, of course, has different requirements. For example, you have to, of course, slap some sort of distributed log manager or cluster file system um, on top of that. So the thing that I was referring to earlier where you have just two iSCSI targets, you just use two separate DOBD resources and, and that's it. There is no need to use a dual primary there. There's actually, I mean, the use cases for dual primary are so limited that we actually have a, a, a technical guide on our website that's titled dual primary, think twice, because there are so many people that look at it and think, I absolutely desperately need this for my application, and they just don't think it through. Um, and there's much more elegant ways to do this with just single primary DRBD. One thing where, where dual primary DRBD is very helpful is, for example, if I want to use virtualization um, with uh, file-backed virtual block devices, and I want to be able to live migrate, because then I simply have to be able to read and write uh, open those uh, devices from both nodes, and the way to do that is to use dual primary DBD, slap OCFS2 or GFS2 on top of it, um, have your clustered, shared clustered file system that you um, have available on both nodes, and then you're able to live migrate as you wish. Yes? So in a dual master configuration, what happens in a network partition? Um, if, we're, if we've got a dual primary, and um, we are uh, losing network connectivity, then we've, in essence, immediately created two diverging data sets, which is something that we have to recover from. That's what we call split brain on the, on the DOBD level. Um, and that is a bit, of a, a bit of a challenge. We're currently not exactly too happy with the way that it's implemented in DOBD right now, which is as soon as a network connection breaks, Poof, we say, okay, we've got two diverging data sets and we have to recover from this manually. It would be much nicer to do that only on the first write after, we, after a, a, a breakage in the network connection. And that is something that, um, well, it didn't quite make it for 8.3.10, but it's something that we're still expecting to see in the 8.3 um, series. But once you've got the two data sets, you have to recover from it. Yes. There is no such thing as a three-way merge on the on the on the block device level. It is, it's, yeah, well, it isn't. You know, if you if you implement Git on the on for a block device, then that that'll be great, but it's just not happening. For this. Yeah. Well. Say again. Well, yeah. Of course you can, but that. Um, that really doesn't help you for the dual primary and replication link breaks use case. For the single primary link, that's perfectly fine. Um, you just you run into a split brain, you kill one of the nodes, done. Brutal, but effective. Um, but for the single primary use case, there's really the, the way that we would have to do it, and that's really, really tricky to figure out, would be, for example, something like first write wins, but then and right, and then shoots the other node. But if you have no connectivity, it's kind of tricky. Right. Okay, um, I think our our talk is on at three or three fifteen. Yeah. One thirty. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so if you want to hear about using this to, in essence roll your own cloud, then come. And if you have any further questions, I think time's up, but I'll be happy to answer more questions because I'm hanging around. Thank you. Thank you.